You're alive. Yay. Great. Okay. Yeah, we're live again. Thank you, everyone. Uh, say something nice in the chat. Let speakers know you're here. Hey, everyone. Hello. Hello. Oh, one word to, to remind our speakers and us. There's actually a little bit, maybe a five second delay sometimes between us speaking and, and the video getting to our speakers and then being able to, to type something back in the chat. So um, you might not get instant gratification, but something pretty close. Uh, so I really want to thank um, our guest speakers. They're uh, CAMH clinician scientist, uh, Brett Jones and Victor Tang. And they are going to uh, introduce themselves because they, they know each other better than I know them. Um, and they know this topic better than I know them. And we're so excited to have them. So I'm just going to let them um, take over. Hey, everyone. Very excited to be here. My name is Brett Jones. I am a, a fifth year psychiatry resident at University of Toronto. Um, also a clinician researcher at um, CAMH. I'm very excited to be meeting with you all um, today. Uh, Vic Victor? Hey everyone, I'm very excited to be here as well. Um, this sounds like it's going to be a really great event. Um, my name is Victor Tang again, and uh, I'm a new psychiatrist here at CAMH. I work in the um, mood disorders clinic as well as the addictions clinic. Um, and as well, I'm a, I'm a clinic, clinician scientist um, doing some research here at CAMH. And uh, we're really excited to uh, do our talk today. Um, maybe, Brett, if you pull up the slides, I can kind of um, just say that uh, this is kind of uh, our introduction and orientation to um, clinical concepts of major depressive disorder. Um, and we're hoping to kind of set like the stage for framing questions that can be clinically important and noticing the gaps in our knowledge. Um, and we'll be um, presenting for most of this morning and then we'll be uh, done right at the lunch break. Yeah, just like, you know, just like Victor said, uh, really our uh, goal today is that um, so we're, we're clinicians, so we, we, we work with patients first and foremost. We work a lot with mood disorders, patients, um, depression, and this is what we've been asked to sort of frame sort of uh, as like sort of the prototypical sort of illness within psychiatric disorders. So the first thing we're going to talk about today just is what is major depression, definition, history, epidemiology. Um, just because our, our understanding is that there are, this is a broad audience, so there may be people who, who may may not actually not know exactly what, when we say major depression, what exactly we mean. Uh, and then really, uh, we then we wanna talk about what we do and, and the information that we gather as, as clinicians, because this is where we hope with, through neuroinformatics, we can all kind of work together to better treat the patients and, and better treat, understand illness and understand outcomes. Uh, and so we, we thought it'd be very interesting and helpful to sort of go through the information that we gather, the gaps where we see problems and where we would love to see um, some uh, more knowledge. Um, for those who maybe are clinically oriented, I, hopefully you enjoy our sort of synthesis of this and, and some of the interesting research that we're going to highlight. Um, for those who, who aren't clinically oriented and and Hopefully you also enjoy that research, but also I, we really think you're going to enjoy having some insight into sort of how we go about an assessment for um, depression. So we'll go through that, um, including the history, management, treatment, and then uh, oh, and then we'll have time for discussion and questions. Uh, we'll be monitoring the chat, so if you have any um, questions that come up, uh, we'll have a few times where we transition slides. We can address that. Um, and we're happy to, to answer any questions you may have. So with that being said, um, so major depressive disorder is a, it's actually like a lo very long standing um, illness, something that's been talked about for a very long time. This is a, this is a slide I took from our, our textbook of psychiatry, which basically is stating that even like 400 BC people were talking about low mood, suicide. The first English text 
dedicated to what would be depression, they called melancholia, was in the 1600s. Um, and then one thing I really wanted to highlight, which is quite interesting, one of the more famous historical psychiatrists, Kraepelin, uh, 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 wrote about sort of this manic depressive illness in the late 1800s, which actually pretty accurately describes the way that we sort of classify the similar illness now, which really goes to show that, that a lot of what we know has around symptoms and presentations has been talked about for quite some time. Uh, so depression, um, so I just wanted to cover these two terms because uh, they, they kind of come up like what's major depression, what's depression. So major, so depression is sort of a symptom. A major depressive episode is what would be classified in um, sort, of, sort of as a psychiatrist, we would classify that as like an episode of depression which lasts at least two weeks, um, typically in the context of the diagnosis of major depressive disorder. And someone who, they must experience additional symptoms to the depression or low mood, um, which can include appetite, weight changes, sleep activity, lack of energy, feelings of guilt, problems thinking, making decisions, um, thoughts of death or suicide. The term mania, um, you know, some of you may have, may have heard this term a lot, used um, like manic depressive or, or, or manic episode or mania, that's, a, we won't be talking much more about this beyond this talk, but I just wanted to introduce it in case people were curious. That's sort of the opposite spectrum, um, where it's people have uh, for persistent or sustained period of time, so they have elevated um, moods, they're much more irritable, doing lots of dangerous, reckless things. And that can last for four to seven days, which we classify as either a hypomanic or a manic episode. And this is usually seen in the context of um, bipolar disorder. And so though we won't be talking much about bipolar disorder, I just wanted, to, in case some people were wondering about mania or manic, so that's, that's where that word comes from. Uh, another just definitions, oftentimes people refer to these as mood disorders. And then within mood disorders, there's depressive disorders. And the prototypical depressive disorder is major depressive disorder. And that's for the rest of this talk, when we sort of refer to depression, uh, mood disorders, we'll be referring to MDD or major depressive disorder. But I just wanted to point out there are a number of other depressive disorders which are similar but different. Um, persistent depressive disorder, disruptive mood and dysregulation disorder, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which a lot of the challenges we're gonna talk about would also relate to a lot of these depressive disorders as well. And then the sort of other spectrum, which we won't talk about beyond today, but is related is um, bipolar related disorders. So bipolar one, bipolar two, cyclothymia, where these can also have uh, depression as a component of the disorder. Uh, so just a little bit about epidemiology. So, um, Again, this is um, very, very general, but uh, so sex, um, so you almost universally observed that it's twofold higher rates in, in women over men. Uh, age of onset, so it's seen throughout life. It's, it, the status saying the average is 40, um, with um, most presenting from the age 20 to, to 50 years. Uh, social, so major depressive disorder is seen often in persons with um, interpersonal conflicts, social isolation, um, and that sort of uh, thing. And comorbidity, so individuals with uh, mood disorders are often at risk of having other psychiatric disorders, and most commonly uh, alcohol disorders, panic, anxiety disorders, OCD, and social anxiety. Uh, so this is a slide um, from a, a very nice review paper, which I've referenced there, which basically shows that uh, the prevalence is very common across the world. And it is um, the 12 month prevalence ranges from the low end is, is two up to, up to 12. But what you can see is if you look at the bottom bars there, the, the low and middle income and high in, in income countries are, are quite similar. So it's a common across um, the world. So I just wanted to touch a little bit about kind of what we know about biological factors. This is a, 
a very high level overview. Um, you know, we could spend the whole talk talking about, about this, but um, historically, major depression was seen as a disorder of monoamines and so uh, ser uh, abnormality, so norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, histamine. Um, and this is where a lot of the work was done. And, and, you know, it's thought because a lot of these pathways functioned in sort of areas of reward, pleasure, um, mood, memory, cognition. Um, and also these uh, amines or serotonin and dopamine are actually the target of the vast majority of our treatments for um, depression. But what I just wanted to highlight and we'll, you know, talk a little bit about more is that in in recent years, and recent being probably more so than recent, there's been a lot of um, discussion around alternative um, uh, theories uh, of the biology of depression. So there's a lot of discussion around uh, HPA axis abnormality and how that leads to changes in the brain, um, uh, immune responses and how that relates to changes in the in the brain. Um, and then what you can see in this figure, which I think is very nicely put, is that you can see the, the arrows are um, directioned in both ways. So, so uh, physical health, so cardiovascular metabolic health leads to increased inflammation, which can lead to depression and inflammation can lead to those poor health outcomes as well. Um, one thing I also wanted to point out, which sort of highlight a lot of the the sort of gaps of where, where we work, is psychiatrists, we work for the most part at the very top in signs and symptoms. This is, this is what the information uh, we gather on a day-to-day -day basis. Our, our medications may impact some of these areas, but, but these aren't areas that the average psychiatrist thinks about all too often. Um, we, we really focus up here at the top um, which is, which I think is probably a, a big, um, a flaw and we'll, t and we'll talk about that. Um, there's also been a new sort of ish emphasis on networks and connectivity. So it's not just sort of, you know, the hormone dysregulation or, or um, neurotransmitter dysregulation. You know, there's a lot of emphasis on um, uh, networks uh, in the brain that are either underactive, for example, um, the frontal parietal network, or the um, dorsal attention network, or are some networks which are hyperactive, like the default network, which is um, the one the one network that a lot of psychiatric, psychiatric research is interested in, because this is the network of like internal reflection and, and internal um, self self referential thought. So you can see if that's hyperactive, you can see how that maybe really would lead to sort of um, mood disorders. Um, and then this is a, a slide I took from a very nice um, uh, uh, meta-analysis of um, uh, imaging uh, data. There's also social factors which which interact. So, uh, you know, it, it's well known that childhood trauma, stress, um, lack of social support, poor coping um, can lead to to depression. And and this slide kind of shows how that this could be biologically oriented through um, epigenetic mechanisms, which, which we actually don't know a, a tremendous amount or, or exactly how to integrate this into um, clinical care. And so what this comes down to when, so, so I highlighted some of these biological aspects that we know about, but what, what really as psychiatrists we look at are, as I mentioned, the signs and the, the signs and the symptoms. So we, we base our diagnosis off of this, this diagnostic and statistical manual. Um, you can't read that writing there, I, I can't imagine, but those are nine symptom criteria. You need two, what we call the A classification symptoms, which is either low mood uh, and or lack of interest, and three out of um, uh, seven uh, additional symptoms, which I mentioned um, before to meet a diagnosis of MDD. As you see, there's no sort of biological aspect to this diagnosis. There's no social aspect to this diagnosis other than uh, the fact that it has to impact you um, functionally significantly. It can be either recurrent, which means you have multiple depressive episodes across your life, or it can be a single episode, which means you have one. 
Uh, and I just wanted to highlight, it. I, I couldn't find a, a good slide for this, but there hasn't been much change to these symptoms or this diagnosis over the past 40 years. And then lastly, um, just for, as far as definitions go, before we move on to the next part, uh, there are some specifiers in the DSM, uh, which you may sort of see or read about in the literature. Um, and, and so these are our, our attempt at classifying some of these symptoms together. Um, so there's melancholic, which is a non-reactive mood, anhedonia, weight loss, guilt. There's atypical, which is a bit of the opposite to that, reactive mood, oversleeping, overeating. There's psychotic features, which is uh, hallucinations, delusions, catatonic, which is like, which means it's like you can kind of think of people not able to move. They're really kind of stuck. They're not eating. They're quite sick. And then there can be people who are quite uh, anxious. Um, and then there's also cognitive symptoms, physical symptoms, and a lot of uh, disruption of sleep. There's a lot of um, disruptions in sleep neurophysiology uh, related to depression, which um, I unfortunately won't be able to talk about today. So that's a very quick overview uh, of what is sort of the current understanding of major depression. And, and now I think what we want to shift to is sort of uh, how we assess for depression. And then we're going to highlight a lot of the um, gaps and, and areas where we have a lot of questions. So I'll stop sharing. Um, and as Victor. Great. Yep. I'm going to share too. I'll and... answer any questions that people have. All right. So. All right, that should be shared full screen here. So I'm gonna take over from Brett. Um, Brett, please stop me if anything looks technically wrong. But um, my next part here is going to be walking you guys through a assessment of depression, kind of getting the history, getting information, getting collateral information and things like that that we do clinically. Um, and so kind of walking you through a bit of the process inside the mind of the psychiatrist. And then at each little point along the way, I'm also going to do an aside about, you know, what are things that we don't know? What is the information we collect but don't know what to do with? Um, and a nod to some of the research that's been going on in that specific area to kind of look for promising opportunities um, with respect to addressing that part of um, data collection as clinicians. So to paint you a picture of what it looks like for us is essentially, you know, when a patient comes to a mood disorders clinic at a center like ChemAge, they're usually referred from the community by their family doctor. And usually they come to you with just a collection of their own subjective experience of depression. And so in this example, this is a woman named Sam who has low mood for about six months. Um, she'll list to us a bunch of symptoms such as issues with sleeping and fatigue and things like that. And so that's kind of like the headline with like the symptoms, but then she'll also have a bit of history giving us about, you know, her childhood, things going on in her family, whether she drinks or other medications that's going on and possibly other treatments. And so what we do as clinicians then is to try to take this snapshot, um, extract a bit more information so that we can make a thorough assessment and treatment recommendations. And so this is usually the kind of information that we gather clinically. And so as clinicians, these are kind of our data points that we are collecting. And then we try to synthesize and analyze in our own heads based on like what's known about the current literature um, and, and make some suggestions. And these are usually the headings and the components of the types of information that we collect. And so as you can see, you know, while a lot of it is subjective and things like that, we do try to be comprehensive, right? We go from everything, not just symptoms, but we talk about past treatments, we talk about their family, we talk about them growing up, 
we look at them, we do a physical exam, we might do some medical uh, investigations, um, collateral history, measurement-based care, things like that. So again, we're trying to be comprehensive and, and despite the limitations of our assessment, I think one thing I wanna emphasize to you guys is that we do collect a lot of information. And um, although we don't always know what to do with this information and maybe it's too much information, we're not sure where things link up, we do collect a lot of data. And, and I think that this is one of the main points of um, a field like uh, neuroinformatics and artificial intelligence is uh, to be able to utilize not only future aspects of biomarker data collection, but also the data that we are currently collecting today. So Brett already went over the symptoms um, that we can collect. You know, there's nine core symptoms. There's a lot of associated symptoms. But one of the biggest problems and opportunities um, to, to re-highlight is how do we understand this variability in symptom presentations? Because as you can already imagine, there's kind of different collections or constellations or sub-syndromes of presentations that uh, symptoms can currently have. So how do we understand kind of conceptually what might be going on underneath under the hood? And this is something that, you know, clinician scientists and researchers have been trying to grapple for a long time. This is like two figures on a conceptual uh, model um, by a depression researcher named Gordon Parker. You know, this was published decades ago, but, you know, we've been kind of struggling with these general big questions such as, you know, on the left, whether it's a bunch of different um, distinct neurobiological issues that just have one final common pathway that eventually all just kind of looks like a similar kind of presentation in this red bar of depressive disorders? Or does it look more like, you know, in, in terms of like a more split splitting up model about like, you know, one, two, three, four, like many different neurological um, um, processes that in their own become their own subcategories of depression. And you can see some of these like uh, bars on the bottom right of like melancholic depression or psychotic depression. And you know, the theories of whether um, this is how things are broken up. And we don't fully understand this yet, but this is kind of like a conceptual diagram of, of ways we've been trying to um, format our research questions. And so we talk about the DSM, and I hope most of you are familiar with the, the DSM, but if not, it's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's kind of, kind of like lexicon or nosology of um, psychiatric disorders and how we diagnose them. And the DSM has gone through a long history and multiple iterations. But of course, you know, researchers and especially biological research have become very disenfranchised with the DSM for, for decades now. And uh, there have been attempts, I want to say recent, but really these are like, you know, a decade or so in the making at least of new psychiatric classification systems. And I think um, everybody in kind of like the mental health research sphere should kind of understand these large movements that come out of very important funding bodies and so on of these essentially just reinventing the wheel of psychiatric classification. And so kind of like the flagship one is out of NIMH in the States of the research domain criteria. Uh, which conceptualizes completely throwing out the book of DSM in a sense, although they don't say this exactly, but you know, you don't see depression or schizophrenia or things like that, but things are just in straight biological um, domains um, looked at in terms of different units of analysis, they call them, for example, the sale level, the circuit level, the physiological level, and then this other access from uh, from the lifespan perspective. And just kind of looking at mental illness in terms of each individual biological building block uh, rather than these syndromes, which we're familiar with. But you know, this isn't the only new psychiatric classification. There's this one called the Hierarchical Taxonomy of Psychopathology or high top uh, which um, organizes things a little bit more reminiscent of DSM, but they try to, to make things a bit more hierarchical so that, you know, there is some sort of like structure, more structure to, to how they fit together. But, um, you know, interestingly, even though these are like two big ones, there are many other kind of large consortiums of neurobiological data gathering that are hoping to eventually delineate new biological subcategories. And if you're interested, there's a very interesting review paper on um, addictive disorders and how, you know, they compare across these different initiatives that are basically trying to collect large swaths of uh, neurobiological data and to begin to organize it into new classification systems. 
And so you can see that there's large efforts of this. Um, and as researchers, you may be interested in, in, in trying to see if, if uh, what, what is going on in these domains is that it may um, lead to collaborations and uh, what other people are thinking about future directions in terms of diagnosis. So we talk a lot about those like, you know, nine symptoms of depression of a major depressive episode. But as clinicians, um, although we start with a snapshot of what's going on, um, we look at the entire depressive episode as well as the entire lifespan of the person. So we look at when this depression started and was it abrupt or was it insidious? Um, we look at, at each onset of depression, was there something that precipitated it? Was there something stressful going on in the person's life? And then we zoom out even more and look at number of episodes. We look at length of episodes. There's this concept of double depression where people may have mild depression their whole lives, kind of punctuated by uh, larger peaks of major depressive episodes. And so I think this is important too in terms of our assessment and getting a larger picture is that it's not just about what nine symptoms do they have right now, but looking at the entire lifespan view. And when you incorporate all of this kind of information, it actually gets quite complicated. As you can see in this like schematic over here, this is a person's kind of life along the years punctuated by these, these down bars are depressive episodes, the up bars are manic episodes. You can see that there's episodes that come and go. You can see on the bottom here that each episode may have been started for different reasons. So for example, this person may have had a depression because their father died at this early age, but then later on their depression was more of an onset um, because of um, discontinuing a medication. And then also you can see then this person, you know, certain episodes in their life, they were treated with lithium, whereas other episodes they were treated with psychotherapy. What we don't understand is, so if we're looking at them, say here at age 80, you know, what does this history of previous treatments and the number of episodes have to do with their current presentation and how we can help them moving forward? And so one of the problems that we have um, with uh, getting a patient's subjective report of all of this is that there are recall bias issues, there's emotional state issues. For example, if you're depressed, you're probably remembering things differently than if um, you were asked what went, what happened to you when you're, when you're in a better mood. Um, sometimes people with depression lack insight into kind of like the impairments that are going on in their life and et cetera. And you may also appraise your life stressors differently when you're depressed. You may think, oh, everybody hates me and, and, you know, my parents don't love me and things like that. But, you know, is that true or is that colored by the depression? And so why that's important is that a lot of our research data is collected for, from the lens of the patient. And so one research example I have for you of this is uh, this recent study that came up that looked at the agreement between prospective measures of childhood trauma versus retrospective measures of childhood trauma. And what these researchers found is that there was actually a very poor overlap in that there were a lot of people where retrospective measures picked up trauma, but prospective measures didn't. And prospective measures picked up and retrospective didn't. Which means that when you ask somebody to remember something going backwards, you might get different information than when you, you know, do a prospective cohort study, for example. And this is very important for the data that we analyze eventually. One of the big issues, too, is about heterogeneity. And, and so this point will be hammered home over and over, but it's a little bit of the bane of our existence in clinical psychiatry. And, you know, although we look try to look for trends in terms of like oh is it more in women or more in men the reality is is that there's a pretty even spread and so in this large kind of national comorbidity survey that uh, came out of america you know you can see that you know there's equal proportions of mild cases with moderate cases of severe cases there's chunks of patients that have a lot of role impairment or very little role impairment uh, role impairment with mild comorbidity or very severe comorbidity and so what this shows is that, um, you know, clustering and trends in depression is very different because it's just so heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous. We will also assess each patient's psychiatric comorbidity. And so what we uh, see in the clinic is that nobody really comes in with pure depression. 
actually it, it's a pretty rare day if ever that somebody comes in and they only get diagnosed with depression after leaving the doors of CAMH because most people will have a comorbid and anxiety disorder or a comorbid substance use disorder and you can see here in again this study that you know any comorbidity is you know above 70 percent in major depressive disorder so this is very important for us in understanding the whole person because um, um, using these silos of disorders will really give us an incomplete picture. A very important, um, possibly understated part of the psychiatric assessment is getting the medical history. Again, most people will not come in with pure psychiatric illness as well. Most people will come in with heart disease as well, or they'll also have had a history of a stroke and things like that. And so in this study, you can kind of see kind of the odds of having these other seemingly unrelated illnesses like arthritis. Um, but for some reason, they are overrepresented in people with depression. Again, even in seemingly unrelated things like cancer, or peptic ulcer disease, and things like that. And so it'll be very important to understand the, the whole person uh, by getting their medical illnesses as well. And also it's important to understand by looking at research literature is that unfortunately a lot of our, especially clinical trials, exclude people with significant medical illnesses, which actually excludes the majority of real life patients. The other thing that we try to tease apart as um, clinicians is kind of this chicken or the egg problem about, you know, is it just they have depression and then they have heart disease? Or did they have depression that led to heart disease or heart disease that led to depression? And what we understand now is that, you know, there's something probably biological or, or otherwise or hereditary going on that links these illnesses together. And major medical organizations like the American Heart Association have realized that, you know, having depression or bipolar disorder actually predisposes you to having atherosclerosis or, or cardiovascular disease far before all these issues like lifestyle factors come in play, like smoking and overeating. And so Benjamin Goldstein is a youth psychiatrist here who studies um, teenagers with bipolar disorder. And he's found in a lot of his research, research that, you know, even as teenagers, they already show signs of atherosclerotic disease. The other thing about teasing apart this medical versus psychiatric thing is um, that meta and medical diseases will quote unquote masquerade as symptoms of depression. So easily, unless um, they get a thorough medical assessment, um, we may miss something like a hypothyroidism or an infectious cause. Um, and these need to be ruled out as well. It's also important to understand that patients come in with a certain medicine or a certain treatment, but these medicines may target multiple disorders. So for example, many of our antidepressants are actually used for pain conditions. Um, and so when we're kind of understanding all of the data points that come with the patient, we see that, okay, they're on this antidepressant, but is it treating their chronic pain or is it treating their depression or both? And is it treating which one better or worse? And so this is not very well understood. The other thing to understand is medical comorbidities may direct the treatment options. So, you know, you might understand that patients usually start with a serotonergic antidepressant when they um, are on uh, presenting with depression. But if they have certain illnesses that prevent them from being able to take these medications, that they won't be able to get certain first line treatments. And so one question I'm kind of proposing with all of these previous couple of slides is, are we ignoring medical comorbidities when we study the biology of depression? You know, we look at a lot about neuronal networks and things like that, but there may be a lot going on with the medical issues and the rest of the body as well. And it's important to look at all information about the patient. So this is another study that came out a couple of years ago, looking at the prevalence of uh, prescription medications with depression as a side effect. And so this is all patients um, in America it's not mental health patients, it's not psychiatric patients, but just patients and looking at their medications. And you can see that at least 37% of all patients will have some kind of medication where if you look at their side effect list, will list depression. So that means, you know, is their blood pressure medication, for example, or something like that contributing to their depression? And, and what does that mean about the whole picture? So we look at past psychiatric history as well. Um, looking through the lifespan. So, you know, 
it really informs us clinically about what this, the feel of this patient's uh, trajectory, whether they've been hospitalized many times or not, whether they've seen psychiatrists before, what kind of medications they've had, what kind of psychotherapies they've had, previous diagnoses they've had, treatment programs. And, um, you know, it can tell us a lot whether they've had treatment or not had treatment and whether that treatment has worked or not. And so sometimes this can be quite time consuming for people that come in, you know, age 75 and they've had depression since age 20, right? This is a lot of information to try to synthesize and make sense of. Um, the other thing is side effects. So when we ask patients about what medications they've been on, you know, a lot of medications may not be working for one. And another thing is they just might not be tolerable because of side effects. Um, and so that tells us a little bit about treatment resistance, right? Is the patient not responding to certain medications just simply because it made them too nauseous? And another thing is that a lot of these side effects can cause symptoms that mimic depression. So for example, many antidepressants are anticholinergic as well. And anticholinergics we know to really affect cognition and memory and attention. And so we'll try to tease apart with patients, you know, okay, you've been on these 10 medications before. So we'll ask them, why are some treatments effective or not? Um, you know, what was it effective or not? What was their subjective experience? There may be biases with this. But importantly, you know, it, we have to realize a lot of the human factors that we face clinically that, you know, need some attention in our, our research and data collection as well, because a lot of people may have just quit their antidepressants for other reasons, such as poor adherence. Um, they stop prematurely due to side effects. And so this is kind of like a graph here at the bottom showing that most people stopped their antidepressants simply because they didn't like the side effects or they just felt like they were feeling better. Um, and so this is important because if you have, and this is a, a number I give here, if you have all these people that come in with a history of depression and they say they've tried, you know, Prozac before, you know, looking at a population level, half of them will have stopped it within 30 days of trying it. And, and we know that most people will need to be on Prozac for about six weeks before they get a full effect. And so some of the challenges with us like um, collecting this data is how can we use it in a research perspective, right? And so this was a very interesting paper um, in 2020 in BMJ Open, which kind of took medication logs and instead of looking cross-sectionally, like we usually do in clinical studies, asking just, okay, what medications are you on? They constructed treatment episodes. And so as you can see in this one year from January to December, they had a D1, which is dose one, and then starting in March, they switched to dose two. And this was um, corresponding to just one discrete episode down here from January to May. But um, they had a second episode after a little bit of, of relief um, starting in August. And then they had dose three and dose four. So if we're seeing patients in December, you know, what does it mean that they've had dose one to dose four starting in January? And would collecting this kind of information um, help provide us with more rich information um, in terms of our prognostication moving forward? Also, when we look at uh, patients and what has helped them and not helped them in the past, it's important to kind of figure out clinically what part of that treatment was helpful or not helpful. And this is a very interesting question that psychotherapists have grasped with for a long time. Because uh, one of the things that's, you know, most readily talked about is what type of psychotherapy did you get? Did you get cognitive behavioral therapy? Did you get behavioral therapy? Did you get problem solving therapy? And so as you can see in this um, network meta analysis on the left hand side, um, when you compare different modalities of psychotherapy, um, I won't try to explain this kind of uh, figure uh, table here for the interest of time, but basically it shows that they're not significantly different than each other in terms of efficacy. And so we have lots of different types of therapy, but it seems like they all perform equally. So one of the big questions that researchers grapple with is, you know, why do we have CBT and IPT? They look very different clinically and clinically we know some patients work with one and not the other, but why do they look equal on a group level? There's another kind of aspect of psychotherapy research um, that's mostly just talked around within psychotherapy circles, which is um, what we call common factors of psychotherapy. And so there is research um, showing that 
uh, therapeutic alliance can influence outcomes or the amount of empathy or the amount of cohesion or goal consensus. Um, and so these measures may be more important in terms of assessing why a person's therapy didn't work rather than the modality. You know, perhaps CBT works for one person and not another because they clicked with their therapist better than another. And so it's very important, I think, in the future of our research to kind of really tease apart these kind of more micro level uh, variables of what makes a treatment work or not work um, and combine this with what we see clinically, which is that patients won't tell you that, oh, CBT was great or not. They'll just say that I had this therapist and they were a jerk, right? Because they just didn't understand what I was going through. Um, and, and it's very subjective, but it can provide us with meaningful information as well. So we get family history from patients. Um, this is important because we know that psychiatric disorders run through families. And heritability studies in a nutshell show, you know, around 30 to 40 percent. But, you know, the challenges in clinical practice is issues with recall. There's stigma in previous generations. So a lot of patients will say to us, you know, my grandma had something. She was, you know, uh, institutionalized, but you know, back then we didn't really talk about it. And so that can really affect things too. And then the lack of validity of diagnoses. I mean, you know, cut and dry way of thinking about this is that uh, 20 years ago, we had a different version of the DSM, right? Um, so the opportunities is, is, uh, in research has been like, you know, perhaps family history is more useful in certain contexts versus others, and maybe useful in certain other disorders. So for example, we know that in things like schizophrenia, there, there are prodromes that we can observe clinically, where before you get a full-blown disorder, there are little signs and symptoms that can be observed and trying to predict this um, based on family history. But what's interesting about us as clinicians asking about a history of, of mental illness in families is that these illnesses probably don't breed true. So for example, you, uh, you go to a patient, and you say, you know, did your parents have anything? And they'll say, yeah, my mom had schizophrenia and my dad had, you know, a cannabis problem. But what we know from the genetic literature is that actually um, the genetic overlap between these disorders is huge, such that um, on a genetic level, perhaps these distinctions are not important. And so this uh, paper out of Science a couple years ago kind of correlated genetically the different psychiatric phenotypes. And if you look at this major depressive disorder column, you can see that there's a large genetic correlation with ADHD, anxiety disorders, uh, bipolar disorder and you know correlations with everything else and you can kind of tell from this heat map that um, basically most disorders correlate with each other such as if you look on a genetic level it may not be that um, um, useful the information about getting um, uh, family histories of specific disorders and what's interesting is that this may be a specific psychiatry um, phenomenon. And so in the same paper, if, if you'll look on this um, left-hand um, figure here, you can see that all of these kind of psychiatric disorders have high correlations with each other, right? ADHD, MDD, schizophrenia, they all correlate with each other. Whereas if you look in this um, right-hand side, if you look at just neurological illnesses like uh, Alzheimer's and epilepsy, they don't really correlate. They don't really overlap genetically. Um, and so, uh, and then this middle is kind of like the, the, the association. It seems like psychiatric disorders do have some association with migraine. But otherwise, it's kind of showing that in psychiatry, we have a sort of unique problem where all of our disorders kind of just lump together, kind of genetically speaking, that the rest of medicine may not. And so, as clinicians, there's little guidance, but you know, you may be interested in this position paper that came out a couple of years ago, you know, titled "What Should We, uh, What Should a Psychiatrist, so a practicing clinical psychiatrist, know about genetics?" Um, and, and the senior author is actually one of our colleagues here at CAMH. But um, you can see um, this table that I've outlined here. What do today's psychiatric residents need to understand about genetics? And so some of you in the crowd may be, you know, genetics researchers, and there's a lot of nuances. Um, to the different uh, studies that we do in, so, in terms of everything from candidate gene linkages to GWAS studies to things like that. But when it distills down to what clinicians need to know, uh, none of it rises to the surface currently. And as you can see, some of these are pretty um, niche reasons to understand genetics. So for example, ordering and interpreting genetic tests for autism and intellectual disability. 
Okay, so that, that's just a sliver of clinical practice right now. And there's a bit, there's some bits about psychopharmacogenetic testing, but the takeaway from this typically is that um, it's not ready for prime time, but we as clinicians just need to get a sense of what they're about. But if you're interested in kind of like what's rise to the surface about what, what is being taught to psychiatrists, you can look at this position paper. Okay, I'm just going to take maybe two, two-ish more minutes here. Um, we collect a lot of social demographic uh, information, their development, their birth, milestones. Look at these social cultural factors like sex, ethnicity, culture. We collect a bunch of information on interpersonal relationships. How are things with your mom, with your dad, with your wife, with your husband, with your friends? We look at the trajectory of their school, their education, their work. And, you know, there's swaths of research out there over the, the, the few, last few decades about how each of these individual factors may associate with depression. But, but synthesizing all of these little data points is quite a tricky business indeed. So, you know, um, there's certain areas that get focused more than others. Childhood maltreatment is a huge one. This is a meta-analysis showing that um, if you've been mistreated as a child, um, so this is things like everything from like divorce to neglect to abuse, um, you're more likely to have recurrences in your depression and de persistence of your depression. We find that childhood adversity is actually dose dependent. So the increased number of adversities that you have, um, the more severe depression can be. And so again, there's a lot of um, research on kind of each of these individual factors. And I think what we're trying to struggle with um, in research now, and, and that uh, big data is is poised to, to really uh, make big advances is to synthesizing these individual factors. We also clinically look at how these um, different pieces of information interact. So, you know, we find out a person's gender, um, and then we may uh, understand that, you know, if they're a woman of childbearing age, that might affect the medications that they take. You know, or if you're an elderly patient coming in, this really affects the treatments we can offer because elderly patients can be more frail, they may not be able to respond to certain medications. So it really directs the amount of treatments or the types of treatments that they can get. So one of the challenges is prognostication is often not clinically useful because we get a lot of information and it befuddles us. Um, we try to synthesize it, but it can be difficult. The other thing too is that, um, you know, in certain mental health uh, facilities, uh, you get an overrepresentation of these risk factors. So in a lot of research, you'll hear about this and that being a risk factor. But when you come to a center like CAMH, which is a tertiary care center, patients are more severe. And so what you'll find as clinicians then is that like everybody has childhood trauma. So it, it really doesn't help you distinguish severity because everybody walking through the door is overrepresented in terms of the severe spectrum. So, so it's very important to understand where you're, sam uh, where you're sampling from. And so research out of CAMH will struggle from this issue in that it may not be representative of the larger population. We collect collateral information too as clinicians. So we, we, we get information from multiple sources. Um, this is important in certain populations. This is an interesting study that showed that if you ask the child about their anxiety, then you ask their parent about the anxiety, you get very divergent scores. So it can be important for someone that's in the midst of their depression to talk with their family members or someone that knows them well. We do medical investigations. You know, we talk a lot about neuroimaging and biomarkers in, in depression research, but you know, in a nutshell, uh, what should be understood uh, uh, um, in the clinical world is that these are mostly just used as what we call medical clearance to rule out other medical causes. So we do head imaging not to look at what type of depression they have, for example, but whether they just have like a tumor or they have HIV encephalitis instead. The other thing is that we try to do longitudinal assessments. When you see someone cross-sectionally for the first time, there's only so much information you can get. I want to, this is the last point I'll make. It's about measurement-based care. So we've been understanding in the last decade or so that using standardized rating scales can help screen and measure and track people's depression better than um, just the interview alone, and that this can improve clinical outcomes. And so these uh, can supplement clinical care, but these are also the scales that we use in our depression research. And so some of you may be familiar with scales like the Beck Depression Inventory or the Hamilton Depression Scale. But I, I, I really encourage all researchers to understand what is 
your scale looking at? What is the purpose of the scale? And to understand certain concepts like the minimal, minimal clinically important difference. So for example, each score, while you may have a change, um, you know, there's certain psychometric studies that will look to see what is the amount of change that is actually clinically important to a real life patient. There's also a very interesting study here out of 2017 in the Journal of Affective Disorders that compared all of these depression scales and found that when you combine all these depression scales, they actually look at a total of 52 symptoms um, that are supposedly related to depression. There's actually a very poor overlap between these different scales. And so you can see this kind of map of the different uh, symptoms in each scale. And some of them measure these symptoms indirectly or directly or just not at all. And so what might happen is that you might have a certain scale of a depression that's skewed towards certain types of symptoms. And you also want to be sure that certain scales um, are giving you meaningful information. So for example, the PHQ-9, which we use very commonly at CAMH, um, has these items that say, for example, trouble falling asleep, or sleeping too much, which are exactly polar opposites of the behavior. And so um, it doesn't give us directionality of the symptom. And so it's very important when we're collecting this clinical data to really look at you know, what um, is our scale skewed towards um, and how that may be affecting our research outcomes. So I'm gonna pass this over to Brett where he's going to talk about diagnosis and treatment. Hi, um, I wanted to alert you guys, you have about five questions in the after question box. So I don't know if you want to stop and start answering or leave them for the end. Okay. Brett, what do you think? Let's, um, let's, let's maybe address some of these questions. Sorry, I, I was looking at the chat box. <laughs> sure. I was neglecting the question and answers. Um, so how long is euthymic period in, in um, MDDs? So, um, so they can vary. Um, in order to be remitted from depression, it would need to be uh, two months. And then beyond that, it can be years to the rest of their life. Or it can be um, lower, uh, or it can be, or it can be uh, significantly less. Um, a lot of what we know is that the more the if people stay on treatment, they're less likely to come out of euthymia. If they go off treatment, they're more likely to to go into depression. And then um, the more episodes you have, the more likely you are to have shorter periods of, of euthymia. There's this other question about how long is the euthymic period? Yeah. Oh, is that the one you just answered? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. How do we know? Do we know the organic basis of MDB in case of environment? Let's say social support. The organic basis. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of theories about this. I mean, essentially, there's a lot of indirect studies that basically show that if you have good prognostic factors like social support, you actually have less of these um, biomarkers of depression, right? So your amount of social support may correlate with uh, the levels of inflammation in your brain or the level of stress hormone in the brain. So we, we do know that environment can directly influence these biological markers. I mean, how they do that is unclear. Um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a rich literature of this that, that I can point you to words. Um, but, uh, you know, we grapple with like the direct link, but we can certainly see like the correlations between social factors and, and certain pathophysiological factors. Is the pediatric history development model usually used while taking history for MDD? Yeah, we use it. I mean, usually it doesn't affect the MDD diagnosis, but uh, it's important for other things. So for example, um, if his people have history of like developmental delay or they didn't reach their milestones on time or they have learning disorder, you know, that may alert us to an organic illness you know, like intellectual disability, they may have a learning disorder, which for example, learning disorders will have issues with school, which may look like concentration issues. So um, is it a learning disorder or is it concentration issues related to depression? So that's usually what it's related to. And the pediatric history can be important because uh, we try to look at temperament. So some kids are more anxious, uh, some kids are more impulsive, um, and there are some uh, studies linking this uh, towards outcomes. Um, so we get a general senses from this information that can be used in our formulations, but um, 
the it, it, it's hard to kind of hang our hat on any of those single points. Um, so quantification of depression and mania, mild, moderate, severe, subjective, right, or to use certain skills. So it's interesting. It's an object. We call it an objective measure on a subjective experience. I think it's it's technically it's objective in that we can say it's a it's a twelve, like it, it's something we can quantify. But it is based uh, almost completely off of. Uh, the patient's um, subjective experience. Some of the scales do have a clinician rated. So it's like, the, it asks the clinician, like, how does the patient appear? Um, but which takes away some of the patient's subjectivity, but then that just inserts uh, the clinician subjectivity. Um, I will talk a little bit about some of the severity and some of the gaps um, in just a, a bit. Yeah, I think one thing to mention about other illnesses like mania is that they're harder to do self-report. So things like mania, a person is quote unquote, like they're kind of like bouncing off the walls, right? And so it's hard for them to sit down and do a scale, right? Or a person with psychosis and schizophrenia, they might think their delusions are real. So they're like, no, I, I don't have like anything that's out of touch of reality, right? And so that really affects um, the, the use of these scales. We have less of this problem in depression though. Uh, this proteome-wide association study across multiple body tissues. Yeah, that, that's a great kind of way to address these things is just to kind of collect like things outside of the brain as well with, within the brain. Uh, unfortunately, causal, it doesn't um, point to things causally because we lose that temporal aspect, um, right? So one of the biggest issues we grapple with is someone got depression and then they got a stroke like 10 years later, or they got a stroke and then they got depression, you know, later. And, and there are a lot of things biologically and socially can happen in between. And, and so a, a lot of the issues with these association studies is, is that they can, they can find a lot of, well, like it says, associations, um, but it doesn't talk about like a, a causality because that needs to infer like a temporal relationship. And and then I think Victor that that last the sixth question that popped up maybe I'll uh, we'll save that until after um, my, my slides and then we can uh, address that question. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, there with me for a second. Just share screen. Okay. okay so, so now I, for the last um, section today. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about diagnosis, assessment, and management, What, how we sort of make those, what we know, the challenges and the opportunities. Uh, and like Victor, uh, I will be sort of highlighting some interesting uh, work um, in that regard. Um, and and uh, some of this may be, you, I, I may be stretching a few points to make a point, but um, for the most part, uh, this is sort of how, how, we, how we work and, and, and and what we sort of do. And and so, so the MDD diagnosis. So Vic, so we got we got the referral from the family doctor. They want to know what the diagnosis is. And the main point of the diagnosis is, is to uh, navigate um, treatment recommendations. And and that's that's where this that's the purpose of the diagnosis. That's, that's really why uh, it exists. And and so for MDD. Um, the diagnosis is, is like I had alluded to before, it's based off nine symptoms. It's two, the low mood or anhedonia, and then a combination of sleep, energy, appetite, concentration, psychomotor retardation, agitation, guilt, suicidality. If you have less than five, it's a different diagnosis. If you have five, it's MDD. If you have more than five, so all nine, it's still just MDD. And, and this will sort of is a highlight to where I think the largest gap in the in our diagnosis is that when it comes down to it, this is the crux of it, is 
what symptoms do you have? And if you call that, that was only the very beginning of, of what Victor presented. There is so much more data that is collected, which isn't well integrated into the diagnosis. Of, of course, psychiatric history plays a component. Family psychiatric history plays a component. But when it comes down to it, it it's it's really based off of symptoms, um, which is, is the main challenge here, um, is how to integrate all this excellent... Uh, excellent sort of information that we have into, into a diagnosis. Uh, as I mentioned before, the subtypes, atypical, melancholic, this is our attempt at trying to cluster um, symptoms. Um, so what's, so challenges and opportunities. So out of the symptoms that we mentioned, there are some very, very common symptoms in anxiety that aren't accounted for, sorry, common symptoms of, of major depression that are not accounted for within the actual diagnosis of itself. So anxiety, so um, worry, or this is just the symptom itself, or an anxiety disorder is highly comorbid in depression. Uh, degree of anxiety symptoms, and not just uh, um, an anxiety disorder, predicts poor response to traditional antidepression, antidepressants. Um, yet this highly common symptom is not integrated into the diagnosis um, whatsoever. Uh, pain is highly comorbid in depression. Um, this also prognostically leads to potential risk of uh, substance abuse, like opiate use. Um, specific antidepressants are associated with good response in um, uh, pain syndromes. Yet pain is not integrated into this um, uh, diagnosis. Things like irritability are not integrated into the diagnosis. And I think what this really speaks to is we can have somebody, you know, call them John, who is irritable, angry, not enjoying anything, really agitated, moving around a lot, not eating, and suicidal. He gets a diagnosis of MDD. And then we can have somebody else, Ben, who is sad, tearful, like down, moving slow, gaining weight, and that's also a diagnosis of MDD. Yet when you see these people, they're very, they're, they look quite different, yet they're still captured in the same um, di diagnosis, which I think is a, a, a major challenge. And, and that leads to what it, it has been seen a lot with, with our diagnosis is that there's a poor biological reproducibility. Um, in the 90s and late 80s, the rage was the HPA access. Everyone thought the dexamethasone suppression test was going to be the test for depression, which basically means you give dexamethasone. If you, su if you suppress it, you don't have depression. If you don't suppress it, you have depression. Unfortunately, that didn't pan out because only like 50% of patients with depression actually had this phenomenon. Then came the inflammatory wave, and everyone thought depression is an inflammatory disorder. And, but when a lot of the research... Is, is quite contradictory. There are patients with MDD who don't have evidence of inflammation and there, there are patients who do. And so a lot of these biological mechanisms are not consistently coming up and there's a lot of contradiction. And then you see papers um, like this one, which um, is a, is a meta-analysis of, uh, sorry, not a meta-analysis, it's a large population-based case control study of, of up to half a million people which, where they examined candidate genes for depression. And without getting into the nuances of this paper, the, the main conclusion was that none of the candidate genes in depression are, are, are valid. And, and part of the reason for some of this could be from the, the challenges with the diagnosis. If, if, you, if, you're, not, if you're studying such different people, it, it can make sense that you're not gonna capture some of this biological um, uh, variation. And so, what some people in the neuroinformatics world have, have looked at is they attempt to address this by looking at uh, clusters of symptoms. So maybe um, certain people with depression have certain groups of symptoms, similar to what we were trying to do with atypical melancholic, and using big data to explore what these symptom clusters um, are. And, and so this study was actually from people um, at, at KimH and part of KCNI, which I thought was really fascinating and really exciting, was they looked at 25,000 self-reported um, people with depression, PHQ-9s, and what they found was that there's four broad symptom dimensions uh, identified, negative cognition, 
functional impairment, insomnia, and atypical symptoms. And so this is using sort of big data, real world, to see how do these symptoms cluster. And what can go next is looking at what are the biological differences among these sort of groups of people? What are the social differences? And through that, maybe we could target treatments a little bit better to maybe target these clusters of symptoms um, together. Uh, another approach that people have looked at, which is quite popular now, is to look at um, this uh, anhedonia symptom, which is one of the core symptoms of depression. And this is where it's like a, a lack of interest and a lack of pleasure. And what people have tried to do is what is the biological underpinning of this? Because then if we understand the biological underpinning of this symptom domain, maybe we can target that. So one approach that a lot of people are doing is using anti-inflammatory medications to try and target the symptom because there's been the sort of uh, hyper-inflammatory state has been associated with the symptom. And what th the study I highlighted here is showing that there's very specific brain regions and polygenic risk that are associated with um, anhedonia. And so using research like this, we can try and understand what's the biology of anhedonia. And then through that, we could better treat anhedonia if we know what's causing it. So again, jumping out of just the MDD diagnosis and focusing on the symptom clusters. Um, there is some like research that certain symptom clusters might improve certain treatments. So suicidality, ECT, RTMS, MST, ketamine, possibly. Anhedonia, as I mentioned, the anti-inflammatories. And how do comorbid comorbidities influence um, uh, treatment response? And so these are all aspects that the MDD diagnosis does not cover, but would be really helpful to sort of include and to have an understanding within a, a diagnostic framework, because then that can truly help us target the, the treatments, which is the purpose of the diagnosis. Uh, so severity. Um, Victor uh, alluded to this earlier. So this is actually just a, the whole PHQ-9. Uh, which is the most commonly used severity measure here at CAMH. Uh, it's assessed by frequency of symptoms and number of symptoms. Um, what you know, one of the main gaps here, though, is if someone has a a, a, a nine on the PHQ nine, a score of nine, they could have only three symptoms. So say the top three, but scored a three on all of them, or they could have every single symptom but scored a one. And the, those two persons would be treated as equally severe based on the score of nine, but biologically, psychologically, they may have very different pathology because they have three symptoms versus nine symptoms. And so that's a major gap with, with how we look at severity. But what we do know though, is that severity is used to, so to really target treatment. So someone who is maybe less severe wouldn't really receive very intensive treatment. They might just be recommended therapy. They, they may not actually take medications. Um, they, they may not actually even see a psychiatrist. They, they may just see their family doctor or, or, a, or a counselor in the community. And as you increase in the severity, you get all the way to the top where people maybe have to be admitted to hospitals. They, they do day treatment programs where they come to the hospital every single day to take part in intensive targeted therapy, experimental medications, so this is how we clinically will you try and use severity is to decide how much or how little um, treatment somebody um, needs. Um, severity challenges and opportunities. So how does how actually does severity influence treatment response? Um, what which symptoms are typically more severe, and what is the rate that these symptoms improve? So like I, as I mentioned, people can have very different symptoms. If someone has, say, the negative cognition symptoms that that other study pointed out, what would we expect on how those symptoms improve versus, say, the psychomotor retardation or agitation symptoms? We don't actually really know that, and, and it's not readily used in, in clinical practice. This study that I highlighted is a very interesting study using a, a large sample from the Netherlands over nine years, and they measured the rate of um, symptom change. And what they found was that the highest baseline severity scores were in the art of, uh, items around energy and mood states. Um, the core symptoms of mood and anhedonia had the most favorable core. So the, the low mood and the anhedonia were the ones who improved fast. Uh, 
where sleeping problems, um, somatic symptoms were more persistent over the nine years. So that really shows that these symptoms, our treatments aren't targeting them. And so we really need to understand how, so that should be better integrated into our measure of um, severity. Um, as I mentioned before, someone with less severe depression might be recommended therapy and someone with more severe depression may be more pushed towards uh, a medication first treatment. But what's actually quite interesting is uh, a, a very recent study of an uh, individual patient meta-analysis found that uh, persons with who received cognitive behavioral therapy, there was no difference in response based upon initial depression severity. So this sort of research shows that uh, we might not actually have a great understanding of uh, how severity should influence our, our treatment choice um, choices. Is, is severe MDD the same biological disorder as, as a moderate MDD? So is the patient who hasn't been able to get out of bed or off the couch, can't speak, is, is not eating, has lost 50 pounds, can't think or concentrate, is completely slowed and highly suicidal, is that the same biological mechanism as the patient who um, just recently went through a divorce, is, is an executive at, at work, is struggling to concentrate while at work, is getting into a little bit more fights at work, is more sad and and also suicidal. Is that the same? Is that the same disorder? Because classically, they, that would both be MDD. Um, so what this study uh, looked at is exactly that. They they looked at the genetics of patients who received electroconvulsive therapy, which is typically a treatment we give to very severely depressed patients, and compared it to more moderate depressed. And what they found was that the genetics of those who receive ECT is much more similar to, to the genetics of bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and not at all similar to stress and personality-related disorders, where the more moderate MDD was more similar to the stress and, um, uh, and personality-related disorders. And so, so the actual genetics of these two spectrums of this illness are, are different. And so when we look at large groups that we really maybe should be looking at severity um, uh, differently. And then the other challenge of severity is, is symptom severity really what we should be looking at? Um, this slide, what, really what I want you to focus on is the very right, which is functional recovery. And in and, and much of our research, we focus on symptom recovery, um, where functional recovery for patients may actually be the most important thing that we should be, that we should be looking at. And how do, our, how do our treatments and how do our diagnosis, diagnoses address um, functional re recovery is a, a very large gap um, in our current uh, workings. Um, so prognosis. So what this means is oftentimes when we uh, meet with a patient, we give a diagnosis, the, the, the patient or the family doctor wants to know, what, are, what is my likelihood of, of getting better? Will, will I do well in this treatment that you're recommending? And, and what we can often give people is based almost solely off of population data and it doesn't have much meaning towards the individual patient sitting in front of us. Some things we do know that duration of untreated depression is correlated with worse outcomes, early improvement is associated with good outcomes, core morbidities prolong the course of illness, and um, yeah. Th this slide uh, summarizes, um, I think a lot of the work that we want to to happen, and 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 where where and 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 summarizes it very very well. So there's multiple biomarkers that have been looked at that try to predict whether or not someone will do well on a treatment. So you look on the very left. There's clinical neuroimaging, genetic, epigenetic, proteomic, metabolomic bi uh, biopsies, and they can be applied to to really any aspect, and, and, and any of these would be great to, to have in clinical practice. So it can be diagnosis, uh, early recognition, um, re response, trajectory. Um, any of these would be, be useful because the reality is we have none. 
we, we don't, there's no real marker that we regularly use in clinical practice um, to prognosticate. And, and really where, where this comes down to is, and the huge gap is the implementation of, of these um, biomarkers and, and really integrating them into to clinical practice, which is where I think a lot of exciting work where clinicians and, and, and data scientists can work together to find ways to really integrate these markers in, in meaningful clinical ways. One set example was a study from a few years ago in molecular psychiatry where they looked at these severe patients with treatment-resistant depression, and, and they did a machine learning approach, which is, is sort of, this is not an area that I'm, I'm an expert in, but what they looked at was resting state networks um, to determine if that would predict response to ECT. And what they actually found um, with a reasonable sensitivity of 84% and specificity of 85%, that it actually predicted overall response. And the authors argue that this can be something that can be used to prognosticate ECT. It's been six, six years, and this is not something we use to progno prognosticate uh, ECT. Um, and part of it can be implementation. Um, I, before today, I was actually prepared to tell you that cost was an important aspect. You know, these scans are quite expensive. And other markers of just even measuring symptoms over two weeks can prognosticate just as well. But then this morning when I was, you know, scrolling through Twitter, someone actually made an argument that, that that's an absurd argument because other areas of healthcare are far more expensive. And like in the U.S., it, it costs $700 to push an IV. That's what they said in the tweet. And they said, why aren't we giving these severely depressed patients, which have such disability and such comorbidity, a, a brain scan, even if it would potentially help prognosticate. And, and, you know, that's actually a very good argument. So I think this is something that we can try and um, implement. I, and I think it just needs uh, clinical trials and, and, and a little bit more evidence. Um, so management. So what, what do we know? So Really, the way we, we, we dictate our management is uh, we try and address this biological, psychological, and social aspect. So when, when we talk about traumas, past experiences, we're really trying to ludicate, is there some sort of um, psychological trauma that we can, that a targeted therapy can address? Are there behaviors that we can address that can help with depression? So is it lower physical activity, more social engagement? And then biological is a main major component. So determining medications, brain stimulation. Um, we don't have a lot of great evidence to determine which medications are the best for the person. It's, it's based often on patient preference, some comorbidities, past experiences, side effects, and um, patient preference. Um, and with some, some exceptions, first-line treatments do not typically target these specific symptoms that we talked about um, and it's often with second medications that we try and target it. Um, so on the left here is actually our guidelines. So we based our treatment recommendations on uh, two or more RCTs that are adequate sample size or a reasonable meta-analysis. So I think that just wants to show you, I just wanted to emphasize that a lot of our treatment recommendations, this is that's the highest level of evidence that we work with. On the right, is a network meta-analysis which shows that antidepressants are effective, which is good news. They, they work. We know they work. Um, the bad news is, is that they don't work too well. And the, that the, this is a, the STAR-D trial, which was a large naturalistic trial. It, it, gave every, it gave patients with depression who have never been depressed before, it gave them one medication, escitalopram, and then the non-responders moved to the next stage where they got another treatment, which is represented by each one of these boxes. If those non-responders went to the next level, which is another one of the treatments, which is, which is represented by one of the white boxes. And what this trial showed us is that response and remission rates for depression for the first treatment are below 50%, and that they decrease each sort of failed treatment. Each time they have to do a new medication, the chance of response and remission decreases. Graphically, what this looks like 
can be sort of a trajectory. So on the very left, the, the line that says optimal response, that's we give someone who's depressed an antidepressant and we, and we hope that they respond to the first treatment and, and they have that upward trajectory and then they're euthymic in remission. The next line down can be somebody who has maybe a little bit of a response, but not fully. They go to the next stage, we give them a second antidepressant and then they get to the top and they do well and that's perfect. And then the third stage you can see is even below. It's a little bit more lower. They're really not responding, but with potentially ECT, brain stimulation or augmentation with an antipsychotic, they they do well and then, and then they remit. And then, then the bottom line is people who really do not do well throughout these stages and, and even through experimental and a lot of treatments that are happening, they're still not, they're still not responding well to the treatments that um, we have, or, or rather the treatments are not are not doing their job. It's not the patients. Yeah. And, and so really what the gap is, is how do we know if we see a patient for the first time, we have no idea which trajectory they're going to take really. And it would be great to have some sort of understanding, whether biologically, psychologically, some sort of marker to determine this. Um, and what a lot of research has done is to try and determine, to determine this, um, so one example is through CANBIND, which is a study in Canada, which is trying to dictate the right patient to the right treatment. The study on the bottom, 2020, was able to show that patients with a very specific symptom cluster of loss of interest and reduction of activity benefited the most from the second line treatment and not so much from the first line treatment. So theoretically, if this was replicated and found to be uh, true, if we have a patient with the, that symptom cluster, we, we can tell them, look, you're not likely to respond to the first treatment. Why don't we just get you to the second treatment? Because then you can you can respond faster. And like I said, we know that the less time depressed, the better the outcomes. And then from the same data set, um, same patients, they used machine learning for EEG data to try and determine uh, who would have the, the best um, response. Um, just to, to wrap up, because I want to make sure we can lose, uh, have time for any questions. This is just showing that patient preference does not necessarily equate to response or remission, and that all it really suggests is that patients will be more adherent to their treatment if they are uh, responding, if they have the treatment that they uh, wanted. And then one thing I wanted to mention that is a huge area of, of interest to myself and I think a lot of psychiatrists is what happens in between the appointments. We see patients for 20 minutes every four to six weeks. Uh, there's a lot of missing data in between these appointments that can be captured through passive monitoring, actigraphy, and how do these changes relate to symptom reduction and or worsening is a great area of interest and a, and a huge gap. And then um, this shows the trajectory so that persons with depression throughout their life will become overall less depressed until they become 50 or 60. And then there is an increase in depression. So how does this integrate into our treatment decision? If we see a 40 year old, a 50 year old or a 60 year old, and then the, um, sort of treatment resistance is really where we're going. How do we, how do we prevent sort of treatment resistance? And I think that's a better understanding of diagnosis and a better understanding of treatment. And then the last slide I wanted to share with you, because this is our attempt in psychiatry of putting all the data together, it's called our formulation. And this is where we look at sort of all this data that we had to try and understand the patient. What are the biological predisposition, the psychological predisposition, what precipitated the depressive episode? what's perpetuating it. And, and so this is how we try and integrate it using this sort of square, it's called a, a formulation. But I think where neuroinformatics can really work is, is, is helping us understand how all this complex data integrates, how all these experiences in someone's lives integrates to the diagnosis and the treatment of, of um, depression. So, so that's um, in a world when a lot of the, the gaps, um, I, th I think we have some some uh, qu questions. Yeah, I was 
I, I've been answering some in the chat just because I know of the time issues. Yeah, this last slide here is this great figure made by this uh, psychiatrist blogger I really like uh, that you guys can check out. Um, he, he talks a lot about um, what psychiatric practice looks like in real life. And, um, you know, the idea I think we've been trying to convey here, too, is that, um, you know, uh, in terms of neuroinformatics, our own brains as clinicians do a lot of data collecting and computation to try to figure out these trends and things like that. And, and I think this is a larger question for AI and things like that in general, is that um, how can our neuroinformatic approaches be different, but also complement um, what we do as humans in terms of understanding patterns and trajectories and prognosis. Um, so hopefully um, you guys were able to see a lot of like the different types of data and the questions that clinicians encounter kind of in the moment to moment uh, of the assessment and treatment planning. Um, but yeah, uh, please ask any, any questions and we're here for a couple more minutes. So I have, so there's this question, I would like to know what will be the treatment strategy if there are receptive receptors are mutated, non-responders might have mutated receptors. Um, so th this, uh, um, to be fair, like I don't quite know, like I don't know what the treatment strategy would be, but what I wanna highlight is that this is, this is where the field needs to go. We need to sort of identify what is the biological or, or other pathophysiology towards the depression. And, and if that is the, if that is the reason that somebody is depressed or the group of people is depressed, then the treatment needs to target that. So most of our treatments, as I mentioned, are work through serotonin as sort of the primary mechanism. We don't really know what happens downstream, but if, if that's not where the pathophysiology of the depression is, there's no expectation that that treatment should, um, should work. Um, so I think that that highlights more of an idea rather than directly um, answering that question specifically. And then um, how well established are the MDD subtypes, uh, melancholically typical, and to what extent do they inform treatment selection? So they're well established in that they, they're well described and, and they're in our textbooks, and they're in our gu their guidelines. But uh, when you, so there's a, the CANMAT guidelines, 2016 with Sydney Kennedy, you can actually very much look, there's a table for that. And for the most part, it says no specific treatment recommendations, no specific treatment recommendations. And there's comments saying some studies suggest that one specific type of medication may work for uh, atypical. So I think these subtypes are valid. They're, they're, they're well reproduced, they're observed, we see them, but they're, they're not quite integrated into the day-to-day the treatment um, uh, decision making. And, and it doesn't mean that they can't be. It, it just means that we don't quite know how to um, yet, um, especially for those two that you mentioned. Um, you know, one thing I, d I do want to, to say, uh, I had meant to say this at the beginning. Uh, I, 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 I hope that we didn't come across as overly uh, negative and uh, pessimistic. Um, I think Victor and I are, are both young career psychiatrists. We're very, we love our field, we love our specialty, we love what we do. And there's a lot of the work that's been done has been exceptional. There's just, we, we need more. And, and we're just not where we, we need to be yet. And, and in our talk, we wanted to highlight the gaps. Uh, we didn't highlight the sort of what we know and what's fantastic and what we do know. Um, so um, there's a bit of a slant um, towards, towards that, but um, yeah. I think we should also um, maybe push to the last slide to give our contact information. Yes. Um, you know, these things are often longer discussions and they lead to other discussions and other questions. Um, so we're very happy for any of you guys to contact us by email. Uh, there's our Twitter handles as well and a couple of thank yous. Um, but we're happy to not only answer questions but have general discussions and even research collaborations uh, for anybody that's, uh, that's interested in talking about that. Thank you. Let's give a big virtual clap Hopefully we'll see for, for Brett and Victor. Um, yeah, it was an amazing talk, just so many important issues and, and a lot of really great discussions. We really want to thank you guys for coming out.
Um, we also really have to thank you because it is the first day of residency and we drew you away from very important medical training uh, that you guys are helping. So thank you for that. Um, I know that you need to probably run back to that, uh, but I want to tell everybody, I'll put up the link again to gather town for those of you guys who want to eat lunch together and discuss the excitement of what's been happening in the course. Uh, the gather town link is now at the bottom of the screen. I feel like it's a YouTuber. It's like, like and subscribe. Smash that like button or smash that gather town button. Um, this one's going to come join us. Uh, <laughs> um, and we will see you back at 1 p.m. to talk about reproducibility and tools um, and a lot of useful information for after the course. So Enjoy the rest of the course, guys. Take care, everyone. Thank you.